Welcome everyone, this is Eagle News. I am Jeff Sanidad in Washington. It's April 1st, 2023, the first Saturday of the month here in the nation's capital. The week's recap begins with the World Health Organization revising the roadmap for COVID-19 vaccination priority groups. The revision by WHO's Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization shows the impact of Omicron and high population level immunity due to the infection and vaccination. Arlino Campo reports. The new COVID-19 vaccination guidance by WHO still prioritizes protection of populations at the greatest risk of death and severe disease from SARS-CoV-2 infection. The new roadmap considers the cost effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination for those at lower risk compared to other health interventions. This includes healthy children and adolescents. It also includes new recommendations on additional doses and spacing of boosters. The updated roadmap outlines three priority use groups for COVID-19 vaccination, high, medium, and low. High priority includes older adults, younger adults with significant comorbidities, people with immunocompromising conditions, pregnant persons, and frontline health workers. Medium priority includes healthy adults, usually under the age of 50 through 60, without comorbidities, and children and adolescents with comorbidities. Low priority includes healthy children and adolescents aged 6 months to 17 years. WHO re-emphasizes the importance of vaccinating those still at risk of severe disease. This including mostly older adults and those with underlying conditions, including with additional boosters. Arlino Campo, National Harbor, Maryland, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. In other news, in Canada, a 16-year-old boy dies after being stabbed at a Toronto subway station. Residents there share with us their thoughts about this kind of unprovoked attack that has been plaguing the city for months now. Yolanda Spiras, tell us more. Another deadly incident happened last weekend aboard the Toronto Transit System. And this time, a 16-year-old boy died after. What Toronto Police is calling an unprovoked attack. The victim, 16-year-old Gabriel Magalhas, was at Kill Subway Station, sitting on a bench with a friend, when the suspect approached the victim, unprovoked, and stopped him multiple times. The victim was transported to the hospital where he succumbed to his injuries. The suspect, 22-year-old Jordan O'Brien Tobin, of no fixed address, was arrested on Saturday and is now charged with first-degree murder. This tragic incident adds to the series of growing violent attacks happening on Toronto's public transit system. We've interviewed some Toronto residents, and this is what they have to say about this growing violence. Personally, I think it's terrible knowing that Canada is one of the safer countries to live in and PTC violence is now prevalent more than ever. Honestly, sometimes I really have no choice because it's just unrealistic to take an Uber everywhere, especially as a working student with no car. Sometimes the TTC is really just the most convenient and the most affordable way for me to get to and from school and work. Not a day goes by where I don't think, will I be next? Will my friends be next or will my family be next? Especially me and my family have been taking public transit for almost all our lives. So it's very scary. It's very, very frightening. I find myself becoming a lot more anxious when I'm on the TTC. I have to be really hyper vigilant just because I really don't know who's sitting beside me or who's standing beside me on the bus or in the station. But I think personally, the city of Toronto and TTC itself is doing a great job in making us feel safe by hiring more police officers in the subway stations, even close to the subway stations as well. Gabriel Magalias was a grade 11 student who, according to his parents, was good in math and wanted to study astrophysics in university. 
Yolanda Aspiras, Toronto, Ontario, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Back here in the U.S., Philadelphia residents have been reassured that there is no need to fear drinking their tap water. This after a chemical spill scare prompted them to panic by bottled water. Myla Simbulans tells us more. Your tap water is and remains safe. This according to Philadelphia's Director for Transportation, Infrastructure and Sustainability, Michael Carroll. Residents of the city panic bought bottled water after a chemical spill started a scare this week. Panic and confusion spread in Philadelphia as chemicals spilled into a tributary of the Delaware River. An estimated 8,000 gallons of a water-based latex finishing solution from the Trinseo Altoglass Chemical Facility in Bristol, Bax County, spilled into the river. The spill location, only 13 miles downstream, an intake pipe, that serves water for Philadelphia's largest drinking water treatment plant. The city initially recommended residents to drink bottled water. This created chaos and left supermarket shelves empty of water. City officials then performed round-the-clock water testing and gave periodic updates about the safety of the city's drinking water. Tuesday evening, city officials gave the residents the all clear. This after analyzing over 100 samples of water they feared could be affected by the chemical spill. During a live stream briefing, Carol says the city's tap water is safe and contaminant free. Miles Simbulan, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Several stories from Thomas I likeness today from smartphones to dumb phones, to a mammoth meatball. All this and more on Correspondent at Large. And now news and commentary from around the globe. We start another month today. It's April 1st. We're a quarter of the way through 2023. Let's look back now, though. You know, in two days' time, on April 3rd, it will be the 50th anniversary of that first cell phone call. That's right. It was 1973 when engineer Martin Cooper stood on a New York City street and made that first call. Cooper is often referred to as the father of the cell phone. And oh, how it's changed, evolved into what it is today, and sadly, how it dominates our lives. Even inventor Cooper thinks people are just too obsessed with these gadgets. Is that people with smartphones uh, uh, look at them too much. They become caught up in the smartphone. And I think we're back in the television phase in that regard. And they're going to figure it out at some point. So where does it go from here? In the future, we could expect the cell phone to revolutionize education. Uh, it will revolutionize healthcare. There is the potential, I know this sounds like an exaggeration, but I want you to know within a generation or two, we are going to conquer disease, eliminate disease. And you know, not everyone's on board with smartphones. Meet Jose Briones, a fan of dumb phones. These are gadgets that are free of attention, grabbing video, games, and social media. His handset doesn't have a big screen, has no apps. The 27-year-old Colorado resident actually uses his dumb phone to make phone calls. Remember those? You know, you, you talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. I think one of the things that people forget is that we used to live without smartphones and that they are a recent development. The world worked before smartphones. So how does he manage life? What does he do if he, well, say, has to get someplace? Well, he's got a couple of options. <laughs> you know, he, he actually asks strangers for direction, or before he leaves, he, he might print out the directions. Briona sums it up nicely. People want to regain their time and attention and have a deeper, more purposeful life. And this is just appalling. A single father in Russia faces years in prison because of a drawing by his 13-year-old daughter. People in this town are shocked. We haven't got the picture here. It hasn't been released. But last year, 
young Maria Moskaliova made a drawing at school. It showed missiles next to a Russian flag. Those missiles headed toward a woman and a child standing by a Ukrainian flag. The headmistress of the school was horrified. She immediately contacted police. Police then said they found comments criticizing the invasion on the social media profiles of the girl's 54-year-old father, Alexei. He's been placed under house arrest for now. Authorities concerned about Maria, who is being raised by Alexei alone, have placed her in an orphanage. She's forbidden to call her father. No word yet on Alexei's fate brings back memories of the old Soviet Union. And if you have a weak stomach, you might want to skip over this item. Scientists have cooked up a futuristic food from the prehistoric past. Woolly mammoths have been extinct for nearly 6,000 years, but scientists using DNA from one of these giant mammals have made some lab-grown flesh, turned it into a giant meatball. It's on display in Amsterdam, contained under a glass bell jar. Apparently, it took several weeks to grow the meat. Not ready for the table yet, though. Scientists want to make sure that it is safe to eat. And I wonder if the first people to try it will give that stereotypical response, you know, when asked what something new tastes like. You know what they all say. <laughs> it, it tastes like chicken. And as I wrap up this week on this first day of April, I want to wish my wife, Shello, a happy birthday today. You know, she's part of the Eagle team here, providing photos and videos of stories that we cover up here in Canada. Until next week, I wish you all peace, joy, and happiness in the ensuing week. Thomas I. Leichner's correspondent at large, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Meanwhile, environment keepers in Papua New Guinea are pushing strategies to combat the impacts of climate change there. Eco Hortaleza Quinola reports on Oceana at a glance. The first trimester of the year brings major impact of global warming in Papua New Guinea. Several unprecedented and often devastating occurrences that affect human life has been blamed on climate change. Catastrophic floods, heavy rains, and higher sea levels worry people across the globe. Papua New Guinea's Climate Change Development Authority, or CCDA, believes climate change does not discriminate. It is a threat to the country as it is to the rest of the world. The sinking of Carteret Islands in Bougainville and the erosion of coastal shorelines are clear examples how climate change continues to threaten the country. The Climate Change Development Authority and the government are pushing to reduce the impact of climate change in Papua New Guinea. In place are policies and action plans, one of which is the REDD or Red Plus Strategy. Uh, for Papua New Guinea, we have um the National Red Plus Strategy. Uh, it sets a way for how the country intends to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that lead to climate change. And also we have uh, mitigation and adaptation targets um, as, as spelled out under the country's nationally determined contributions. Those uh, targets need to be focused on and uh, all stakeholders, government, private sectors, civil society organizations and the private citizens should work collectively hand in hand to implement those existing plans and policies. And for Papua New Guinea, and if other countries as well, if they could also do the same, then we could address climate change collectively as a globe. Addressing the impact of climate change is something countries must do now and not later. Eko Hortaleza Quinola, Port Morris, B. Papua New Guinea, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. The data on autism from across 11 states in the U.S. are in. Findings show that autism prevalence has increased in the communities monitored by researchers. Roselle Ferrier reports on this week's Health is Wealth.
one in 36 eight-year-old children from 11 communities in the ADDM network have been identified with Autism Spectrum Disorder or ASD. ADDM is Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC, the new findings are higher than the previous 2018 estimate that found a prevalence of 1 in 44. The data, however, are not representative of the entire United States. A second report on four-year-old children in the same 11 communities highlights the impact of COVID-19. Because of interruptions in childcare and healthcare services during the pandemic, four-year-old children were less likely to be identified with ASD. The data also show, within the communities monitored, autism was detected nearly four times higher in boys than girls. Still, this is the first ADDM report in which the prevalence of autism among 8-year-old girls has exceeded 1%. The ADDM network is the only network to track the number and characteristics of children with autism and other developmental disabilities in multiple communities throughout the country. Russell Feria, Washington, D.C. Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. In the world of running, half marathons are useful in training for a full 26-mile race as well as an excellent alternative for those looking for a challenge at a shorter distances. In Los Angeles, California, Eva and Alan speak with runners about their half marathon pathway. Take a look. At a little over 26 miles, a marathon might be an intimidating prospect for some, and that's where a 5K or maybe a half marathon might become a viable option for others. These distances are by no means easy and are important in training for races with greater mileage. Training for Boston Marathon, but I was using this as a training run. The energy was amazing. I mean, the crowds were incredible. I mean, we had there was cheering from start to finish. There wasn't any times that I recall where people weren't cheering and had bells and whistles and everything so the energy was electric the only thing with the half so the half at mile two you merge in with the full so you're bobbing and weaving the entire way um through uh some of the marathoners that were like in the back so that was the most difficult part because you're kind of moving around and when you're trying to get water or whatnot it's kind of difficult to stop at the uh, the water stations and everything because you, you literally constantly from mile two to, to the finish, you're running around people the entire time. Just the bobbing and weaving kind of messes with you mentally, but I look at it as good training, you know? It's, it's benefit to it all. So I use the race as training for a Paris marathon. My first marathon is coming up. What really makes this half marathon unique, like I'm a black woman, I'm an African-American woman, and you won't see a lot of black women running. So to finish, as one of the first black women in this race really means a lot to me. I feel like I represent people who want to road race, but need to see someone like me. The objective is to just start and just finish. And if you can just have that objective, you will go so far. A number of runners we spoke with agree that a one foot after the other mentality is needed to finish a race. But starting a race, well, that begins long before the first step is even taken. When a person decides to identify their own limits and then push past them. Eva Allen, Los Angeles, California, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. A Filipino-American artist brings to New York her public art installation. She says the piece is a reimagination of the architecture of the first permanent Asian-American settlement in the U.S. In Long Island City, Joanne Soriano reports on this week's Color My World. What can an exhibit on climate change teach us about Filipino history in the United States? At Socrates Sculpture Park in Long Island City, New York, a show entitled Sink or Swim Climate Features is currently exhibiting five projects addressing the urgency and challenges of climate change. Among the various site-specific installations is one structure that will be very familiar to Filipinos. This piece called Disappearing St. Malo was designed by Filipino-American artist Cheyenne Concepcion, who we were able to speak with. Disappearing St. Malo is a 
participatory public art installation. It's a freestanding structure made of dimensional lumber, um, bamboo, and it has a thatch roof um, made of industrial grade mylar. The structure itself reimagines the architecture of the first permanent Asian American settlement in the United States. Um, which was a floating fishing village in Louisiana established by Filipino sailors. One of the most interesting parts of the history of St. Malo is that it's so misunderstood. There is still a lot of things we don't know about St. Malo and remnants of the village exist today, but it's mostly gone. There is a marker um, of where it once stood. So I wanted to remember this place. I wanted to talk about this history because no, I'm 30 years old and just discovering that the first Asian, permanent Asian American settlement was by Filipinos. And so part of my work wanting to bring visibility and like um, recognition for our history um, is important to me. The main influences on my work were uh, researched by two Filipino American historians. One is based here in New York. His name is Dr. Michael M. Sagarolo. He really wants to talk about how St. Malo is actually a radical space because a lot of the times throughout history, the men of St. Malo, they were called Manila men, painted as pirates, they were painted as eaters of human flesh, but they were actually very autonomous. They were making money. They were changing the fishing industry in Louisiana. So they were powerful. He talks about that, which I love, and that's a, an important component of retelling that history. And then the other artist that, um, or he's a writer that I included his name is Randy Gonzalez. He's a descendant of one of the Manila men from Louisiana, and he's based in New Orleans. He's a professor at the um, University of Lafayette. So he has a book of poems being published this year on um, Filipino Louisiana. I want more diversity for allegory and form of public art. My little soft spot for that is Filipino American history and how we're gonna use uh, how I can use my work to create more space, to create more um, visibility, and to be recognized as important. Joanne Soriano, Long Island City, New York. Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. Women's History Month this year has concluded, and with that, our story brings us to Corpus Christi, Texas. A local group there launches a movement to honor and celebrate the achievements of women who positively impact the community. Here's Jane Kathleen Gregorio on Community Care. A movement to honor female leaders and entrepreneurs took place in Corpus Christi, Texas. La Jefa which in Spanish means Lady Boss, is the name of the initiative launched by a Corpus Christi, Texas resident, Melina Gosa. The BOSS program, which stands for Bringing Other Sisters Support, invites the public to send in their nominations of women who they believe are making a positive difference in the community. The nominees were then recognized at the very first ever La Jefa Awards, which took place during the International Women's Day. Among the nominees, a total of 10 awards were distributed, nine of whom to women in their respective fields, and a 10th award given to a junior La Jefa member who was helpful in her community. So this was an opportunity for me to bring women together and to combine our resources and be able to help two local nonprofits versus one on an event that empowered women and showed women what we can do if we all focus on each other's strengths versus weaknesses. Um, actions like these are important because it builds relationships, it builds community, and it helps us all work smarter, not harder. Jane Kathleen Gregorio, Eagle News, Corpus Christi, Texas. We live in extraordinary times. What is your favorite getaway destination? What things do you scrimp on and splurge on when you're on vacation? Are you a solo traveler or one who brings everyone to the trip? In Seattle, 
Mike Hudson shares with us your answers. Take a look. Hey folks, who here loves to travel? Personally, I can't get enough of it. There's something so liberating about exploring new places, meeting new people, and trying new foods. And you know what they say, travel is the only thing you can buy that makes you richer. I love to travel a lot. My favorite destination that I like to go to is in the Philippines, Palawan, El Nido, to be specific. The best place for me is Turkey. And um, I would like to go to Turkey. There's a lot of historical places. You know, I've been to Europe. I've been, you know, last year I went road tripping all across the U.S. And yeah, I could definitely name you know, a few places I would enjoy going back to. So this cabin that used to be my grandpa's back um, he homesteaded on some land in the Mojave Desert back in the early 1960s, had his cabin built. And um, I've been going out there since the 1980s. My favorite travel destination has been Crazy Horse Monument. I enjoyed going to Mount Rushmore, but Crazy Horse I found far more interesting. So one of my favorite places to visit, when I go there, it's um, the south part of Albania, they have really good tropical beaches and I just have such a blast when I go there. My favorite place to visit uh, is Hawaii. Why do I love Hawaii? Um, not only the people, uh, the weather, uh, the places to visit uh, are amazing. I love going to the beach. I love um, just laying on the white sand. Uh, I love the big island my favorite out of all the islands there's eight of them and it was really cool like it was totally fine traveling by myself last year I went on a road trip across the US over 10,000 miles 42 days on the road and that was definitely a really really cool experience um, I what I really enjoy about solo travel is it's it's all on me my my own time I decide where I want to go how long I want to stay there you know that's it I mean it's completely flexible yes there are a lot of pluses to traveling alone because you can set your own itinerary but traveling with at least one other person you have someone there that you can talk about the experience with and discuss it and get excited with them over what you're seeing how i budget for it is that i save up for at least a year so that i can prepare for the next year i make sure that um, I save up by um, really prioritizing things that I, the wants and needs. I want to make sure that I just don't buy things if I don't need it. One really uh, big thing that I would suggest is to bring sunscreen. Uh, anytime you even walk out the door there, uh, you need to protect your skin. A few travel tips if you visit, if you ever get to visit Albania, it's Try any food possible, even if it's street food, favorites. They're all good, they're very clean, so worth it. Whether it's a quick weekend getaway or a long-term backpacking trip, travel opens your eyes to new perspectives and experiences. So if you haven't already, book that flight, pack that bag, and hit the road, and trust me, you won't regret it. Michael Hudson, Seattle, Washington, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Before we let you go, here's our photo of the week. This is the gigantic skull rock at Joshua Tree National Park. The National Park Service says that years ago, raindrops accumulated in tiny depressions and started to erode the granite. As time passed, after more erosion happened, two hollowed out eye sockets formed and the rock began to resemble a skull. Thank you to our friend Pearl Rugashon for taking this photo. And thank you all for joining us again. If there are stories or topics you want us to share with you, just comment below. View, like, share our other shows. Stay the limits with Alan Basiliahe. Connected with Dr. David. Take a seat and join us with Anna Kui. Plate date with Mike Hudson and friends. Plus, Journey, Stories of Filipinos Abroad with Kathleen Cruz. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, at Eagle News Live. 
I am Jeff Sanidad. We live in extraordinary times. Happy weekend, everyone.